and welcome to Handmade Hero Show, where we code a complete game live on stream. I actually made a crucial error yesterday, <clears throat> a judgment error, uh, that I need to correct today. It's fairly minor, thankfully, but I just thought of it when I was falling asleep last night, or failing to fall asleep last night. Uh, so I'm going to start today with that, and of course we're just doing what we've been doing, which is cleaning up our renderer and making it into a nice little system that can be used more generally. Uh, which I think is a very good uh, technique to learn. Uh, if for no other reason than even when you're working on projects where everything is entirely controlled by you and you don't need anyone else to use the code, sometimes you need to compartmentalize things for your own benefit. And cleaning up the renderer has already paid a lot of dividends for us. We've removed all kinds of things that were problematic in there. Things like uh, we still had the screen resolution getting passed through and used in places where it turns out if we just stayed in clip coordinates the whole time, it eliminates entire complexities in those systems. Things like that, they build up over time as you're developing a system and figuring out how it should work. At some point you need to go through and clean those out because otherwise they're constantly antagonizing you. So simplifying, cleaning up, changing the interface to comport with the new way that things finally work in the, uh, in the end, these are valuable things to learn and I like spending time on them, uh, which is why we are spending time on them. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, <clears throat> talk about the mistake I made yesterday uh, because what I did was I said very specifically, I was like, well, uh, inside the renderer, if we want this to be abstract, what we could do is there's a number of things we could use a C++ virtual inheritance mechanism. Uh, we could use an enum. We can use a table of function pointers. We can use, we can use, we can use, right? And I was like, well, you can kind of pick whichever one you want. I actually picked wrong. And I realized because I wasn't considering something. I realized there is a good reason to go with one of those uh, structures. The one that I think you should go with, that there actually is an argument of why it's correct, is you actually should go with a table of function pointers. And the reason you should go with a table of function pointers is because, duh, why not let renderers get loaded out of DLLs, right? It's exactly the kind of thing we might want to do, provide, allow people to write their own renderer DLLs that just drop into the game and then the game can load them dynamically and render on them, right? It's the perfect excuse to do that. There's no cost to us. Uh, as long as we just make platform renderer be a, a table of function pointers, at that point, anyone can write a DLL that we can use to render and we can make a thing in the Win32 layer that loads. We don't have to do that right now, but uh, making the platform renderer be callback based out of a function, a table of function parts lets us do that. Not only does it let us do that, it lets us mix and match those DLLs. Like we could even have uh, different DLLs getting fielding different pointers by changing which function pointers go to which ones, right? Why is that relevant? Well, for example, we can have a uh, accelerated, uh, uh, one that's compiled in release mode and one that's compiled in debug mode, right? And we can call the release mode renderer right up till the point where we want to debug a frame and then switch the function pointer that we actually care about, whichever one it is, uh, to be the debug pointer, right? And step through that code instead. There's all sorts of things we can do uh, if we want it. So I think this is just a better idea. Um, so I, I, I think there's a good uh, reason why this is actually the wrong decision uh, and the right decision really looks more uh, like, like get proc address, right, is what we actually want here. Uh, so if we're going to do that, we just need to know the things we were using a switch statement for should really just be part of the dispatch table. Uh, again, not because I have anything against the switch statements. I actually love switch statements. I think they're great. Uh, just in this case, they're not the appropriate uh, solution to the problem, in my opinion. Uh, that's in Win32 Handmade OpenGL here. Uh, so these switch statements, we really uh, just want to change them to callbacks. Again, it's pretty straightforward how we would do that. Uh, we just need a good place to do it, right? Uh, and off we go. So what I'm going to do here is take the functions we were calling. Uh, there's only three of them, I think. Uh, let me just see here. Yeah, this is all there is. So out of uh, each of those, we may want um, a way to shut down the renderer, but I don't know that probably needs to be platform specific. So really, I think we're talking just about these, at least at the moment. Okay, 
Uh, so I'm going to have a renderer process texture queue. Um, I'm going to have a renderer begin uh, frame. Uh, and I'm going to have a renderer end frame. And each of these is just going to be a macro that defines the kind of function that I'm talking about here. So for example, in the case of process texture queue, uh, what we're talking about is something that looks like this. Uh, this is what the function prototype always will look like. Similarly, for begin frame, we're talking about something that looks like this. Uh, and then finally, for end frame, we're talking about something that looks like this. Oh, not quite like that. And that's just a way to quickly define what these are anytime we want. Again, the reason I use this define process is because it allows me to generate all of the things that I want just from one line of code. So this right here can generate the type def for me. Here, for example, is going to be my uh, renderer uh, process texture queue. Uh, so this defines a type def of a pointer to a function. So I can use that. Right? Uh, and I can do this for each of these. Uh, oops, render begin frame. Uh, and here, is the end frame version. So each of these is now a, a texture pointer. I mean, a texture, that's good. A uh, function pointer inside my renderer. And we just need to call them when we want to use them, right? That's what we're going to do in each of these cases. Now, if you look at what's going on here, um, each one of these, like we've got the, uh, the type test here. The, again, like I said, the reason I do the functions is because now when I actually want to define the functions themselves that are going to get used, I actually can just do that directly. Um, I'm going to delete these here. We do know that we need to include this uh, in the OpenGL end frame. So I'm going to put that in here real quick. Uh, but let me go ahead and do that. So if I want to define one of these now, I can just do a Win32 OpenGL end frame. Uh, that's the function. And I can go ahead and make in here the calls that I want to make, like so. Right? So inside my uh, Win32, I can define these callbacks that I want uh, and how I want them. Again, process textures would be the same way. Just grab these out here. And it doesn't have to do anything special for the Win32 version here, so we could consider that moving it in. I'm not going to, I'm just going to leave it all in the Win32 side, just in case in the future we want to do Win32 specific things in there. Uh, and then finally, we just want this version in here. Again, very, very simple. You've seen me do this before, if you're uh, regular to the series, very straightforward. That just goes ahead and provides those callbacks so that the renderer uh, knows what it's doing, right? It's like these are these are the, the, the three ways that we interact with the renderer. Uh, we know how Win3D OpenGL works now. It's these three ways, right? Those are now defined to be compliant with these texture with these uh, function pointers, which means that when we actually do a Win32 init OpenGL, uh, when we come through here and do an OpenGL uh, initialization, when we get down here and are about to return this, this is when we want to set these function pointers so that they can be called. So in here, what we're gonna do is actually just set them. Now we do our alloc here. I'm gonna set them just right off the bat. So I'm gonna set them right in here. You can see the, the ones I need to set, they're these, right? Uh, so there's the header. And I'm gonna set these individual uh, function pointers to be uh, the functions that I just defined on the Win32 side. Uh, so each of these is what we want. So here's the begin frame. Oops. Uh, here's the process textures call. And I feel like I'm going to put that first because it seems like the ordering is this one, this one, this one. So I'm just going to keep those. And that fills out our function table. 
right? Now, again, this is very similar to what would happen in a virtual function call scenario, only we're using a slight difference. So in a virtual, and, and I like to go over this a couple of times because people, we don't do any real C++ uh, stuff on this stream because I don't like it. I don't think it's very good, but it's worth understanding how it works. So the way a C++ Im implementation would have worked is very similar to what we're doing here, but with a slight difference. So it, a C++ implementation would do it like this. And it would do this for you automatically. Do you see the difference there? So in one case, we have a renderer and in the renderer are the function pointers themselves. And we're calling directly through those function pointers, right? So we get a pointer to a thing and we say to use the thing, it's got some pointers in it. We just jump through those pointers, right? Okay, that's, this, that's what we were doing. The C++ model is indirected again. It says, hey, uh, we got a platform renderer. We're actually gonna point to the table of function pointers. So we're gonna first look through that pointer, then look through the other pointers to do our dispatch. Why did they wanna do it that way? Right, it adds an extra indirection. That's bad, right? Well, you have to understand C++ evolved at a time when indirection wasn't really that big of a deal as compared to maybe space, size, amount of memory used, right? And you can see why this takes a lot less space because every object you instantiate right, in the C++ parlance only needs one pointer. It just needs a pointer to the table. Whereas in our version, every one you instantiate needs all the pointers in themselves. That may be better for cache coherency, maybe. I mean, you don't know until you check it, right? Um, because that table would probably be hot in the cache a lot too, right? But point being, it adds more size to the object, which you might not want to do, right? So it's worth noting that there are trade-offs there. C++ generates this one for you. That's what a virtual function table is, is a thing that looks like this. You never get to see it, but that's what it's doing. I'm doing something sort of similar, but not quite exactly the same, uh, and it looks like this. And again, what I will do in the future is I'll probably get proc address these out of a DLL so that we can have different renderers that drop into the game as we decide that we want them to be, right? Um, so that's all, oops. Oh, that got started there. I must have hit the F key accidentally. So that's all that difference is. It's not particularly different. Um, I like these methods a lot better when I create them myself because it gives me more control. I don't care for the way C++ tends to do things most of the time, which is why I don't use it. But it's worth understanding. It's not magic, right? You can make the same thing yourself as C++ can make. And if you let C++ make it for you, you don't have to sit around wondering what they're doing. You can actually go look even in the debugger and see that what I just said is what's happening, right? With those, um, with those function calls, right? You can see that your struct has that pointer in it. You can see uh, that it looks through that pointer to get the table. Okay. Uh, so once we have that, now we just need to make sure that we're actually using these calls when we wish to dispatch to the platform renderer. So when I compile, uh, we will get complaints. Uh, now I'm going to have to pre-declare the platform renderer here since this it gets passed in there, but that's fine. I probably also have to do the texture queue. Uh, yes, maybe. I guess not. Um, probably the game render commands though. These are just forward declares so that those names can be resolved. There we go. Uh, and texture queue. I was right, I did need it. I was like, won't I need the texture queue? And yes, I do. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, so now all we need to do is make sure that, uh, that uh, each of these things, wait, how did that, that is not what I meant to do at all there. That was some, that was some copy pasta for me there. <laughs> that was actually the allocation code. Why did I do that? I have no idea why I did that. That was just dumb. All right, well, sorry about that. This is the allocation code. I don't know why I put it there. Um, our allocation code at the moment um, we aren't coming out of a, um, uh, 
we aren't using an actual DLL yet. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave this as an internal call you can make. Um, and in fact, you can just call Win32 and it opens jail uh, as a, you, you, you could almost call it directly, but I don't want you to cast it there. So I'm gonna pretend that we have sort of the DLL loading thing going on here uh, for the moment and we'll get to that later, right? Um, so if we have uh, this call here, uh, really all we're doing is proxying this call, um, like so. Do it this way. Um, all we're gonna do is proxy this call here, so we need to call this something else. So, you know, this is just kind of arbitrary how we're gonna do this. That's how I'm gonna do it for now. Um, so that's all we really need to do. Now we just need to change our calls into it. This allocate renderer call is really just gonna be went through to uh, open gel load renderer for now. And we're gonna change that to use a DLL. Um, and then if I come through here and I look at, uh, uh, oops, that's passed in the wrong order there. There we go. Um, all of these just need to call uh, off of the renderer, right? So the renderer that we have they're just, we're just calling off of the renderer. So every time we want to do whatever we're doing here, we just call off of the renderer, right? Very, very straightforward. Uh, now for begin frame, I don't, like I said, I don't really remember what we were doing for begin frame here, but I'm, I think we didn't really do anything for begin frame. I'm pretty sure it was just the, uh, I'm pretty sure it was just a straight call through, right? I think this is all we were doing. Um, I don't think there was any actual other stuff. Uh, so I think this is actually what, and, and all, we really needed to do uh, here. We just need to cast this to the kind of pointer we actually have. And I think that's it. <clears throat> So that's the only change I wanted to make. Um, and like I said, we can load this out of DLL. Maybe we can compile it as a DLL now just to prove that point, but that's really it. Um, and so now everything just works fine, right? Uh, let's go ahead and make that change in Handmade Hero as well. So in here where we do this, instead of allocate renderer, I'm just gonna call Win32 uh, OpenGL renderer uh, and pass these in like so. And we can still do a lot of things we could do with an enum, or we're just gonna do them with a file name in the future, right? Uh, because what we can do is say, look, whatever file name you loaded the renderer out of is the renderer you're using. And that can be saved and loaded from disk as well. So we'll get the benefits we would have gotten with an enum as well. So there's it running outside of Handmade Hero, the renderer. Here's it running inside Handmade Hero, uh, the renderer in both cases. Uh, these are both unoptimized, they're debug builds at the moment. So that I think is just better. And again, like I said, the reason that I think that's better is because it allows us to load uh, the renderer out of a DLL and not have to worry um, about like letting other, if other people wanna provide new renderers, they just can. This is kind of fun, I feel like. Like let's suppose someone just wants to make a ray tracer for Handmade Hero, they just can, right? They can just replace a DLL, they don't have to touch the game code at all. Right, they can just drop in a new DLL and it would work. So I'm kind of curious, right, if let's say we want to do that, let's say we actually want to just make it be uh, part of the DLL, uh, we already know that we can build DLLs pretty easily, right? We have uh, a way to do those things um, and we do them for the game, right? So if we wanted to, as far as renderer uh, was concerned, right, we can have a thing here that's like, you know, renderers. Uh, and we can build uh, in here the renderers that we want to build. So if we want to, I don't need to include Ayaka at the moment. So if I want to build one of these, I can, uh, and I can make a, a file that will allow me to do that. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, uh, and try. So you can see here we pass some stuff. I don't need to specify the PDB in this stuff. We may want to do that uh, at some point, but you can see here we uh, build in some exports. 
what I want to do is define those exports to be uh, uh, very specific calls, right? So if I now want to break this out into a DLL uh, in Win32 Handmade OpenGL, which is the code uh, that we're talking about specifically, if we look at what those have to be, uh, what we can see here is like Win32 init OpenGL and so forth. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Win32 end frame, begin frame, and uh, process texture queue, right? These are the functions that we actually want to be generic across renderers. I can change them to be like this. Well, okay, you know, I just realized even that I don't need. Those don't need to be exported because we actually just need the initialization to be exported. So if we take a look at what actually needs to happen here, it's really only the, the load call, right? Because since we load the pointers into the thing we provide, we don't need to export those functions because no one's gonna bind against them. So if we just export the load, then on load, you will call it, you'll get back the struct that's got the functions in it you need, you're done, right? Uh, so what I'm gonna have it be here is just platform load renderer. That call uh, needs to take some information with it. I'm gonna call it Win32 load renderer, I think, because since it's platform specific, it's gonna need information from the app that's Windows specific, right? Um, that is important. So it's not a platform agnostic load call because it needs you to it needs to be called from the Win32 layer, and you would need another shim. So you'd need uh, like Mac OpenGL or whatever if you wanted to do this on Mac, right? Because it needs to have Mac specific startup code in it. Okay, uh, so that's how that would work. So if I just go ahead and say, look, we're gonna export this function, okay? That's gonna come out this DLL, right? It's gonna come out. Uh, then what I can do is build the DLL out of this by saying uh, Win32 handmade um, OpenGL, Com please compile this for me. That can now be its own compilation unit, right? So I'm gonna try that just to see what we can do if we make it, all right? So the first thing we have to do is change a little bit about the way we do our, uh, our comp compilation here. All of this stuff that we used to call, like uh, that we used to include, we don't need to include anymore. So the OpenGL side of things, like all this stuff actually doesn't need to be here anymore. Handmade OpenGL, render OpenGL, those things are actually not necessary anymore. Um, outside of the OpenGL render itself. Those are gonna be baked in here. Now we still need all this stuff because these things um, uh, are themselves used inside the renderer, but we don't need to include any OpenGL specific things in here, right? So now let's go ahead and build. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, so now we just need our platform includes, like things that we rely on from Windows itself. Uh, that's just this stuff. There we go. Uh, and similarly now inside here, we don't need to include OpenGL anymore because we're not gonna include the OpenGL renderer, right? None of this has to know that OpenGL exists at all. We never have to talk about OpenGL if we don't want to, right? Okay, so now let's see what kind of problems we get here. Uh, we're getting some of a read, some kind of problem with a redefinition. I don't know why. Uh, who is doing that? What's happening here? Oops. Uh, somebody is doing some kind of a pound include that I don't like. Uh, but I'm not sure who. I don't see why that would have happened actually. Do I accidentally include the same thing twice somewhere? Let's take a look. Uh, C++ doesn't Compilers don't generally have the best error reporting for things like this. Some, I think LLVM has considerably better uh, error reporting. Um, so, yeah, but let me just double check what's going on. Uh, we don't care about any of these or these or those or those uh, or those. So we're really just talking about inside handmade types. So this looks... I don't know, this looks pretty reasonable. What's the, how did we get multiple find symbol for buffer? Struct type redefinition. Where did it, so we're including, we're including handmade types twice. 
I'm just not sure how I did that because I didn't think I did, but I obviously did. Um, oh, <laughs> there's the culprit right there. A file should not include itself, just in case you were wondering. Um, all right, let's see what else we got. Um, open GL debug callback undeclared event. So this GL debug callback pound define, uh, that looks like that wasn't done yet. That's probably because it's all in here. So uh, some of these definitions should, uh, we should probably move down. So I'm guessing that we just wanna do uh, this here to make sure these are all uh, already accounted for. Let me just double check that. Yeah, there we go. Um, so Win32 load renderer is the only thing uh, in here that we're actually exporting. So that's the function we wanna export. What you can see here is even though I clearly have it defined, you can see that it can't find this symbol. Why not? Uh, well, the reason that it can't find it is because this thing isn't uh, unfortunately exported in any, it, it, it isn't set up to be named that on, um, uh, what's the word for, uh, on compile. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you pay attention to all of Handmade Hero, you already know what happens here, but this is kind of stretching it. It goes way back. So for those of you who don't remember, when you compile C++ code, it mangles all the names. What that means is, hey, C++ allows overloaded functions. It means two functions with different parameters, but the same name are distinguishable. In order to support that in the old days, uh, since names were typically used to bind functions uh, to their call points, what they did is they just made up new names that included what the parameters were in the name. So you could still use the old linkage system for it. That means that Win32 Load Renderer doesn't come out being called Win32 Load Renderer. It comes out being called some really ridiculous long mangled name instead. What we have to do uh, if we want to tell it to not mangle the name so that we can find that and export it is just call it extern C. Once we call it extern C, it knows that that name will uh, stay the same and we should be able to do it. Of course, as I say this, it turns out that it actually did not find, <laughs> find the name. So I take it back. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Uh, I will have to find out why it decided not to. That's <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, I guess not. Um, let me look at that build again. Uh, I assumed that it would do that for me. Uh, apparently, it wouldn't do that for me. So, you know, uh, oh well, uh, 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 such is life. So, my assumption was that, hey, if we're compiling Win32 Handmade OpenGL, and I just marked this as extra in C, Win32 Load Renderer uh, will come out as a function uh, that is named what it is named. Uh, but unfortunately, as you can see in here, uh, that's not actually what happened. So, forcing it to export this, uh, it didn't actually want to export it. Uh, woe is me. Now, I'm not sure why it didn't, because I feel like once I do um, an extra in C on that, it should have done it for me. Uh, and so now I just want to know, well, why are you having trouble finding that function? I specifically said that this should be fine, right? Uh, and so I just want to know at this point, what did I screw up? I obviously screwed something up and I'm just forgetting something important that I was supposed to do. But the question is, how do I figure it out? Uh, so the first thing I want to do is just look to see, hey, uh, if this went through to handmade open obj, right, which is the thing that got created when it compiled this file, can you just tell me what you thought was in here uh, so that I know what the names were, right? Like, can you give me some information? Um, so what I'm going to do is try running a thing called dump in. It's part of the Visual Studio utilities. I'm just going to ask it, can you just tell me what can you tell me about this OBJ file you compiled? What's in it, right? Uh, what are what you know? What what do you actually have it in there? Maybe I'll do all just to see. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, maybe not quite that all. There we go. The fact that exports didn't tell me anything uh, suggests that I've got issues, right? But uh, that's kind of beside the point. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, if, if exports doesn't show anything, I think I'm kind of dead in the water. So that's obviously the problems that we've got. Uh, 
Let's take a look at those symbols there. Oh. Duh. Oh, man. So uh, maybe the long pre-stream threw me for a loop. Uh, you'll notice I still was saying that it's an internal, which is a, which means static, right, to us, which means it's not going to export it. So I don't know what I was thinking there. That is all it is. Uh, yeah, so when you say something like that uh, and you say that w when you say that something's file scope only, it's not going to appear in the import table, right? So we have to remove that because even though I said extra in C, it won't mangle the name. What I'm curious about is if I get rid of that, is it smart enough to override the name? Um, I think it is. Yeah, that's what I thought. So when I first put that extra in C in there, I was like, I shouldn't have had to do that because usually, at least my recollection, and they change these things all the time, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. When you specify something to export, it usually turns off the name mangling for you on that automatically. Usually, right? So I was weirded out by the fact that I had to do it. I forgot that this static will over, like that takes precedence. This isn't strong enough to uh, override that. Don't ask me why, uh, probably just because this is to the linker and this is to the compiler. So it never actually gets this function far enough to do this, I suspect. So I think if I want to do this, I think I'm actually okay. I'm not sure though. Um, meaning just get rid of the internal and you're fine. Let's double check. So, oops, I don't need symbols there, sorry. I just need exports. Um, let me see if I can get that to show up. Well, that didn't actually show up, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's okay or not. I'm not sure if it's okay or not. So uh, let me finish the rest of this linking, and then we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll toggle it either way. So what you'll notice is we can't finish compiling because we have a bunch of undefined symbols. Those undefined symbols are, are all linker issues. They're uh, libraries that we need that we don't have. Now, I don't know where we defined these, but they're basically all in here. And we're gonna at least need the OpenGL32 and the GDI32 stuff. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put those on here. Let me just go ahead and see uh, where we've got there. And then, it, yeah, yeah uh, so, Handmade when, so with you do handmade open gel, I don't know where these are coming in though. Destroy window, create window, register class. I don't understand why those would be involved uh, in Win32 handmade open gel though. So I, I want to just look and see why, why are those getting called, right? Uh, just so I can double check like that they should be. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. Ah, uh, yes. So we had to create a dummy window in order to test for these things first. Okay, so that's fine. I just wanted to make sure those should be there. There's nothing wrong with doing that. So I'll leave that in there, but that means we do need to link with user32, which is where the standard window functions come from, right? So that's all good. Uh, so that allows us to build our DLL. There we go. Uh, and now we're done. We, you know, we've, we've got a DLL built and it should be ready to go. I'm gonna check those exports again. Um, so it's weird to me that that doesn't have that in there because uh, it looks like it does here. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, my fears about the mangled name though were still correct. So it, it, it looks like you still end up do, with, do end up with a bunch of name mangling. Whether that's actually a problem with the DLL, I don't know though, because you can see here it knows that the name is a short name. I assume that's the one that it puts in the DLL's import table, but who knows? Let's run depends on it to find out. Uh, so again, this is something that will allow us to look at our DLL and see what it actually is exporting, like what it actually directly says. Uh, and that's just a way to know whether we did that correctly or not. So, um, I was actually in the right directory there. So here's that went through to your handmade open gel DLL. Uh, and if we look at that after an incredibly long time of it walking tons of things because kernel now depends on 8 million things and blah, 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 blah. There we go. Uh, we should be able to see what uh, we actually depend on. 
And here they are. These are the four things you depend on. That's what we want. Those are things we expect. So let's see what we export. Here's what we export. You can see that even though the name itself, uh, we didn't extern see it, right? So you can see here, we didn't extern see it. The fact that we told it we wanted as an export, it did use the comfortable name for us, right? So that's exactly what we wanted to happen. So we don't need the extern C. Um, it understands that name mangling isn't appropriate for being in the DLL. So when we named it that in the export, it, it puts it in there correctly. So now we've got a DLL that we can just use. You know, we can just call that. Uh, so that means if we wanted to take our Win32 render test now, what we could do is say, okay, let's go ahead and just get rid of any notion that the Win32 um, OpenGL renderer is built into here, right? Let's get rid of that. And instead, let's call this as a function call. So let's do it right here. Here's the load library call, right? And for those of you that don't remember, we're just gonna pass a name uh, of a library to load, uh, dynamic link library to load. Windows will load it. We can then get function pointers out of it by name. Um, so if you go uh, familiarize yourself with this function, if you don't know what it is, right? This is it right here. All you have to do is just pass a file name to it. That's it, right? That's all you have to do. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna call load library. And again, remember we were, we want this to work in Unicode or otherwise. So we're gonna use this text macro to wrap it. This is just in case people compile Unicode versus ASCII. We want it to work in either one. Um, I believe you have to use load library A or W if you wanna call a specific one. So we're just gonna let it call the default one for however the person's compiling. Um, and we're gonna pass in in 32 handmade opengl.dll as a string that's just, it makes it easier for the person to understand what's going on, right? Um, uh, they don't, they know that we're just wrapping the string um, with whatever kind of, you know, whether it's supposed to be a UTF-16 or UTF, well, or ASCII, right, or ANSI. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the, the load library here. Uh, the load library is gonna return me this module and that module handle is literally just a handle to the loaded code. Right? It's just a way of identifying to Windows what code I'm talking about. Um, and so here's the render DLL. At that point, what I wanna do is just get the function pointer uh, for loading this, um, uh, for loading the renderer out, right? And so in order to do that, what I wanna do is again up here, I kind of wanna define um, the way that Win32 stuff gets loaded, the problem with doing it in here is this is a non, this is a platform agnostic file. So what I wanna do is I wanna have um, in the code base, I wanna have a Win32 handmade uh, renderer.h. This is a thing where Win32 specific stuff uh, will live. It's very short file, unfortunately, but we need to have that um, uh, accessible basically to the system in this way because we need a place to define the window specific uh, call, right? So what I wanna do there is just say, okay, to load the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to load those in, we need something here that will, that will uh, load the render. And you know, I can also take advantage of the fact that we've got this Win32 handmade renderer bit here. I can make that actually be something that you link in, which has the Win32 code necessary uh, to load the, the renderer as well. So I could like wrap this up in there actually, that might be uh, a good way to do it, but we'll, we'll kind of get to that as we go. So what I wanna do here is just say, all right, there's a Win32 uh, load renderer call. Again, this is exactly the same way uh, as I was doing my other function callbacks. And so inside here where we've got this Win32 load renderer, I want that to be a function prototype because every DLL that's on Win32 that supports rendering uh, that anyone would want to make wants to conform to this. So what we're going to do is the exact same thing we did before. We're going to supply the name here um, as part of the macro, and then we're just going to go ahead and define this. So here's our type def for a function pointer to one of these loaders. This is going to be Win32 load renderer, the call. That's the type def. Um, and then in here, we're just gonna use that. Okay, so that's it. That's all we needed. 
Uh, and now we know that this uh, is the, the function pointer that uh, we're trying to load. We also can make it so that uh, this name itself is actually a specific name that we always know. Um, so we could even do it like this. Right. Again, these are just there so when people make these, they just do that and they know that they're going to define the right thing and they don't have to think about it ever again, right? So you just do that and you know that it's defined properly for you. And if we change what's getting passed here, uh, everyone can just recompile and run OK. You know what I'm saying? Um, so if we do that, right, then in here, what we can do as well is just have actually... Uh, we can have uh, this be something that, that just is built into the, the H file. So we could say like, hey, yeah, win through to load renderer, um, uh, you know, load, win through to load renderer DLL. Um, and this would just take this thing, right? Um, so whatever you pass through to this, whatever like tcar, you know, string you get here, uh, this is the file name. We can just make that uh, be something in here that loads the renderer DLL in and then does a get proc address on that renderer DLL uh, using the win32 load renderer name and make sure that all of that stuff is specified properly. I don't think you can get proc address wide Karastar, so I think that's literally just uh, like, I think there's no get proc, I think it's just get proc address. Um, I can't quite remember though. So we'll double check that uh, later. But anyway, um, so if we load this out of the DLL, there's our, you know, retrieving our function pointer. That means that the user of this can literally just do this, right? They can get their, their uh, renderer loader uh, out here by calling this uh, function and then they can call it whenever they want, right? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's see here. Um, what's the problem there? That's not what I wanted. Just want Win32 Renderer. There it is. Um, so here's the definition of that. Uh, function, but Windows DC should have been defined there. So what's the problem? Oh, the problem is this isn't including it. That's all. Okay, um, so that probably should be down here after everything's defined. Okay, and there we go. Uh, so that also has to get included here, like so. Uh, but otherwise I think we're fine. Okay. So this is pretty straightforward now. It's basically exactly the same thing we were doing before. It just comes out of a DLL now, right? So now if we look at what this code does, uh, what we should be able to do is if we go to the render test. Now remember, the render test is now being built with no OpenGL code in it whatsoever. It doesn't even need to link to OpenGL. In fact, let's go ahead and make that true just so we can double check, right? 
So here's a renderer test bed. Um, it's past common linker flags. So common linker flags here uh, includes all of these uh, sausage gentlemen, right? So OpenGL32 uh, is included in there. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. So OpenGL32 is no longer included in there, right? So we, we no longer require OpenGL to even start. We will start up with no OpenGL uh, bound at all. Okay, so now if we loop through here and we take a look at what happens, let's start a breakpoint when we enter our renderer thread. Right here. Uh, and if I step through here, what you can see is when we do Win32 load renderer, um, I'm gonna come through here. Um, here's my file name, Win32 of I'm gonna try to load it. I load it successfully. I'm gonna try and get the address of this procedure. I did get it. Um, and so now we can call it, right? We can call in here uh, and call in at OpenGL. So now this is running entirely in an external DLL, right? And we can make as many versions of that DLL as we want, uh, which render through different things. So right now, literally, if you wanna go make a D3D version, you can just do that, drop it in place, and you can run on D3D, right? So we are now not, we have no coupling to OpenGL whatsoever in that test bed which is great, right? So that's a nice way to keep that flexible. Now, um, if we come back here and look, we note that we do have, you know, we probably wanna, you know, maybe put up an error message or something here, right? <clears throat> like if we try to load this, um, Uh, maybe we just exit process if we can't do it. Maybe we even push up, put up a message box, right? Um, and so, for example, if I was to say, uh, you know, message box. Here we go. So it's window, text, caption, type. Type in this case is... Uh, fatal error. Um, so we just want this because there's really nothing else we can do. And then we probably want icon exclamation or, well, icon stop or icon error. Maybe icon error. Let's say icon. Okay, so if we look at the call to this, we want uh, uh, the window handle there, which we have. Uh, we want our two text things to here to be um, Okay, so now if we fail to actually get this, let's just exit process with an error code there. Oh, okay, um, whatever, I don't care. Um, so now if we fail to actually find that, uh, that renderer, we just can't start, right? If we don't have a renderer, we can't start. So here's us finding the render. If I now go in and without recompiling um, to generate a new one, if I just delete, right? I just get rid of um, our renderer DLL, which is this thing right here, then we should find that it pops up a dialog box, right? <clears throat> and just says, hey, we're, we ain't going nowhere fast, my friends, right? Um, so this is pretty great, right? Now we're, we're good to go. We can just treat this render as something uh, that's externally usable. Uh, anyone can do it and uh, you don't really have to think about it too hard, right? We can also go one step further and figure, well, okay, if this is the stuff that someone has to do to get started in Win32, well, why not just make it completely trivial for them? Um, why not just do this? Uh, 
Uh, right, so we can just say win32 uh, load default render or initialize default render or something like that. It doesn't take anything. Uh, well, no, actually, it'll take this. It'll do all this for you, including popping up the message box if it's not there, uh, and then it'll return the renderer to you uh, in this case. So that wraps all of that up really cleanly, and you can just say, hey, do everything, please. I don't want to think about it. So that's just a, again, a really simple utility function. So now, you know, anyone can just call it. It'll check to see if it's there. It'll fail catastrophically if it's not, um, and off you would go, right? Uh, so that's just, again, just really basic, uh, nothing particularly uh, exciting going on there, right? Very, very simple. So if we wanted that to work in Handmade Hero as well, again, nothing really particularly odd has to happen. Um, first of all, uh, we got to make sure that we don't include any of this stuff. So now like these things like Win32, uh, OpenGL and so on, like that stuff just shouldn't be in here, right? Um, none of that stuff should be included in there. Uh, it should just be missing. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't want, so I don't know where all these th things are defined. We don't want that, right? Um, <clears throat> we really, we don't need these either because those would now be outside. In fact, all of this stuff, I don't even know if SIMD is necessary there. Uh, probably not. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's it, right? Uh, and so all we would need to do now is have went through to handmade renderer included here and then we're good to go. So at the point where we were doing Win32 load OpenGL renderer here, we can just call that utility function, that same one that we had here, which is Win32 uh, init, right? And we would pass the window there. Uh, so then when we run the, you know, this is using that DLL, when we run Handmade Hero, it now uses the exact same DLL, like they're literally calling the exact same DLL, whether you're running outside or inside, right? So I didn't think of that yesterday, otherwise that's the way I would have done it. I don't know why I didn't think of it. A renderer is an obvious thing to just stick in a DLL. Now anyone who wants to screw around with Handmade Hero and implement completely different renderers, you can go do a crazy optimized cool renderer, you could do a ray tracer, you could do anything you want. You can now just put that into the renderer and be done with it, right? I wouldn't recommend doing that quite yet because we're still working on the, some of the API stuff here, um, but that's what's going on, right? So now we've made that clean split and I think that's pretty great because <clears throat> now when we have the final version, we'll be good to go. Okay, um, so now what I'd like to do is just focus on cleaning up some of these other APIs here. Um, so let's pop back over to our renderer test, which is this. Um, so looking at the renderer test, like I said, I'd like to clean up some of the camera stuff here, um, and I'd like to clean up some of the sprite push stuff. Those are the two things that we really have left to clean up there. And then I feel like we're mostly down to just uh, making the header files pretty, um, maybe, breaking down the code into uh, 
making it clear like what you, you would and wouldn't use in various circumstances and so on. Like, so just like kind of general text cleanup uh, that's not really about the code. It's just about how it's organized in files so that it's easier to carve off or things like that. Um, so we, we got maybe a little bit to do there, but mostly we're good. All right. So if you take a look at all this stuff for the camera information, um, just you can look at this stuff we're doing with camera. And I feel like we can wrap a lot of that stuff up uh, into some, some basic functions that people can use uh, in the math library. Again, this is just for the sake of people who don't want to necessarily uh, think too hard about this stuff. If we look at get standard camera params, um, one of the things that you note here is just that uh, that's actually defined in the renderer, even though I'm not sure that the renderer necessarily cares that much about things like camera params. So if we look at the camera params themselves, it's just focal length now. So I think what we want to actually do is change the way that we're thinking about camera params to be sort of their own thing. Uh, and then when you do rendering, uh, you can pass like whole, like more complex things down uh, to functions uh, as necessary, right? <clears throat> So the first thing I want to do is sort of get rid of anywhere that talks about camera params that's directly in the renderer. So for example, uh, well, actually, you know what? I don't think we do, which is good. So the renderer doesn't really care about these, right? So what I was thinking is we can just make a thing like handmade camera uh, that's just got a bunch of camera utility stuff in it. And that's like optional if you want to use it, right? So I'm going to go ahead and make a handmade camera. Oops. H. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is just grab the stuff. I'm going to just go lemon grab here, uh, the camera params out and put them in here. Okay. Uh, now when I compile, I'm going to get, I don't include this anywhere. So I'm going to get some problems uh, in the places where we don't have those camera params, right? So I'm going to grab, uh, again, just lemon grabbing here, the, uh, the code that relates to this and putting it uh, in the handmade camera stuff. There we go. All right. Uh, and so now everyone who uses those is kind of at a, a disadvantage because, hey, it's gone, right? Oops. Uh, but that's okay. Anyone who wants to use it can use it and they can just include uh, handmade camera.cpp, right? And handmade camera.h. So now anyone who wants those utilities can use them, uh, but that's where they come from. Then what I want to do is make sure any, uh, anywhere we use them, now we can expand on kind of the what a camera param actually is uh, and what it can do for you is sort of what I want to, to push on there, right? If that makes sense. Uh, so let's go ahead and just put that in here. Again, this doesn't really matter too much uh, where we put these because it's kind of arbitrary. We're just putting them all in here, right? Um, maybe I'll just make sure they're underneath uh, the, wherever the renderer went, uh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. So now if I come back over to win 32, uh, render test, and I look at what we're doing in here, um, with the, with the camera stuff, you can see all of this information, uh, that I've got in terms of setting up a camera view for looking at a character. Uh, on the screen. And what I like to do is just move that over so that it all gets initialized automatically uh, and you don't really have to do a lot uh, to think about it, right? And all of this stuff, we can start to have uh, happen automatically as well, right? Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, Let's just go ahead and do that. So <clears throat> here's my uh, camera routines. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to start by pulling out uh, some of this information here, right? So what you can see is when this stuff happens, you can see that we're not really using this uh, yet. Uh, the first place that we start to use it is down here. Um, and we do this like camera OT plus camera offset, right? And then we pass a bunch of stuff, the camera O information here, 
you can see all the stuff that we're doing. Um, all of that, I want to start making more, um, like I want this to be more encapsulatable to people who don't know what they're doing. They can just use something here, right? They can just use something um, that does this automatically for you. So at the very least, I want to do something like this. And I'll be honest, I don't understand why this camera O can't just have the T baked into it, right? So to actually just to even do it slightly differently than that, let's not even do this yet. Let's just fix this uh, so that we're good to go. So if I take this camera O here and I just translate it, right? So instead, you know, when we're doing here, I can say like get translation out of it or whatever. Let me, let me, um, Look at translate here. So you can see this translate call. I'm just gonna go ahead and say, uh, you know, camera matrix. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna translate the matrix that comes back by this uh, by the camera dolly amount, right? Um, so that's how much I'm gonna translate that by. And you can see I also add this camera offset in, which is this thing here. Uh, so I really just wanna add the camera offset too, right? So that's really what I'm trying to do. And then, in, so when we come down uh, through here more, uh, I think that pretty much just gives us what we want, right? Am I wrong about that? Let me just double check. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I'm not quite right. We do use it to multiply first, right? We use it to multiply here. However, I mean, just to be clear, if we were to make a translation matrix to begin with, um, that would have just worked. So, I know this is a little bit confusing. These operators will operate on this if it was on the right side here, right? So we could have just said this. Right, that is actually the same thing. Uh, so what we really want to be able to do is do a translation, but it looks like we don't have a thing for building a translation matrix here. Uh, no worries. That's about the easiest matrix you could ever build, right? So we'll just call that T. Um, here's the matrix we're building. If this is the identity matrix here, right? Um, we know that uh, when we actually do our translation here, that we're going to be multiplying. We're multiplying column vectors by row vectors, right? That's how we've structured our matrices to work. So we know the W uh, component of one is going to be multiplying these values. So if we want to translate something, all we have to do is put our translation in that final column, and that's where in the matrix translation will occur, right? If we then put this back here, like I said, flowing through the matrix, this will automatically do that transform because as these rotations concatenate on, they will rotate the translation that exists in the matrix as they're doing their multiplication. So this camera M just basically builds everything we wanted. Um, and so here we can just say that. Right, uh, and that just recreates exactly what we already had. Um, you know, everything should work well. That's the wrong program. Uh, that just recreates everything we already had, and as you can see, it's just doing that operation. Right, uh, nothing particularly special going on there. Okay, um, again, we can continue this process if we want. You notice this is a translation that happens in this order. R remember, we again, we've gone all over this in Handmade Hero uh, all before, but I'll just keep saying it uh, for people who, you know, it, well, it helps to say things multiple times, right? So matrix concatenation, 
because of the way we're using our matrices, which is to say that the columns of our matrix are the object axes, right? Not the rows, the columns. It's our choice how we wish to organize our matrices. It's our choice how we set up that math. We chose to go with the traditional math formulation, not the traditional graphics formulation, where the objects uh, are actually rows. That's a whole nother situation, but we went the math style. Uh, because of that, when we actually concatenate transforms together, it means that you can think of reading the transforms from the right to the left. So the first thing that happens is we translate by camera dolly. The next thing that happens is we rotate by the camera pitch around the x-axis, that's this twist. And then the final thing we do is we rotate around the z-axis by the camera orbit, right? So the order goes from right to left. That's because when matrices are multiplied together in that order, right, you are, I can't really give this entire explanation. You should go back to how many years when I explained how matrix, uh, matrix multiplication works. But because we are doing it in that order and that is how we have structured our matrices, we are constantly doing the reinterpretation from right to left. So this matrix is reinterpreted in the coordinate system of this matrix, which means that this one is the one that is applied conceptually first, and then it is reinterpreted here and then reinterpreted here, right? And again, we have lots of information on that. So if I want this camera offset to be applied and I want to get rid of that in here, I can just do this, right? I can just put it here. And again, that series of matrix concatenations uh, will just give me exactly what I want. Um, what is the problem? Syntax or semicolon, oops, I deleted one too many. Um, and again, I can just build that all up with one matrix operation. So this is the complete one for Dolly at, with an offset at the end plus a, and, a, and an offset at the beginning, right? And then the sort of the orbit cam in there as a separate issue, right? Now, if we wanted to, we could also add shake in there. So if we wanted to give it a, a bit of a way to, to shake this way, um, we also could. I don't know that we need to do that at the moment, um, but you can see why I want to pull that out because then that way we can get it, it more into a, a, a way of just getting the camera matrix here out directly this way. So we can say, uh, you can see me starting down how, uh, the road to where I want to be in terms of um, uh, of an API here for the camera, right? So I want to make a call that's like um, build camera matrix, right? Uh, they kind of want to wait to say that this is the matrix that says what the camera itself is in the world not the camera transfer matrix. So those are two different things, right? The matrix that moves things into the camera space for viewing is actually the inverse matrix of the one that tells you where the camera is in the world, right? Those are opposite operations. So I'm not sure what the best name for that is, but that, you know, uh, is kind of a separate issue. So if I just implement this directly, uh, where you pass the orbit, uh, the pitch, uh, the dolly, uh, and the offset. I now have a function uh, that gets rid of some of that math for someone who, again, uh, might not be uh, uh, knowledgeable enough about 3D math to know uh, what was going on there and might be confused. But this is probably easier for them to understand. Um, because it's going to do the math for them, right? Uh, so hopefully that cleans up that a little bit and just makes it easier to make that call, but we still have a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, and again, we could make this much simpler by uh, sort of continuing to reduce uh, the degree to which you need to interact with these things uh, to set up the camera. So again, refining the API a little bit further, the question is what else can we do um, and like, how can we do more with fog settings and so on? Like, how can we start to roll all that stuff up into one? 
You know what I mean? Um, and so what I would like to do here is say, well, what if get standard camera params is maybe something, uh, again, that now can sort of come out here. Uh, and we can have this uh, camera params uh, that, that sort of rolls up a bunch of this stuff. Uh, maybe what I can do is just call this camera um, and, and not camera params because it's just not really necessary. We don't have an actual camera object thing in our game, so we don't need to worry about that conflicting. Um, so what we could do is just roll all this stuff up here um, and actually make this be something uh, that gets specified more directly. So let's suppose we just took all of this stuff um, that we've got in line here, uh, put it all into this, Um, and set all of these things based on that information. So then when you get one of these uh, standard camera params, you actually get a whole lot more than, than that, right? Oops. Uh, and where's that focal length? Uh, oh, it's right there. There we go. Right? So this gets that automatically, and now when we come down here, we can sort of start to work with this as a as like a bucket uh, that has all these things in it. So then we can make a version of this that just works with camera params directly. And you'll notice I'm not going to get rid of this one because maybe we still want to be able to call this one. So all I'm going to do is say, hey, um, if you call this on here, it's just a utility to avoid you having to think about where those things come from. So you're just thunking through to the existing API call. Again, this is about granularity here. This is about giving you uh, those options of calling something at a higher level or calling it at a lower level if you find that that's better, right? Now, camera offsets didn't get put in here, so it needs to. Uh, so we actually want our camera uh, probably to look more like this. Right? Uh, and then we need this to actually have all these things in it. So there's the pitch, the orbit, the dolly, uh, the focal length, near clip plane, our clip plane, just like the transform parameters, um, and then the offset. Oops, don't ask me what that just did. All right. Okay. Uh, so once we have all that, now again we can we can just continue to simplify these things uh, really nicely, uh, which I will which I will do. Um, and so now, right, we still want to be able to do these things, and we can, right? We can still just set these things anytime we want. Uh, we can also just now simplify this call because it's just that. Um, and then we can imagine, again, what, you can see where we're going with this. We'll be able to simplify this call as well uh, to be something that you can use without having to think about what it's doing, right? Uh, so let's keep going. There we go. Uh, so now you can see, again, same exact results, but now the person who made this app, if they weren't us and don't know 3D math, it's getting simpler, right? It's getting simpler and simpler and simpler for them. Uh, and that's good, right? That's what we want. So let's keep it even, uh, let, let's just keep pushing that as far as we can push it. So set camera transform. Um, I'm going to change the name of this to use camera or view from camera, right? 
Um, and that's going to be uh, a utility. It's going to take a render group. Uh, and it's going to take a camera. And it's going to do this work for you. So now you can just make the semantic call, hey, I would like to view from this camera, please. You don't have to know anything. It'll do all of this work for you. And now it's just semantic. Begin a group of things. Here's where I want to view them from. I push my scene on, all the stuff I want to draw. I end, and that's the end of the frame. Right? <clears throat> uh, very, very, very straightforward. Right? Um, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we know we need that camera matrix. Well, that's okay. That just goes right in here. Uh, then we do all of this stuff off of the camera that we have. And it's as simple as that. Now note, this is, uh, kind of exactly like what I talk about when I, uh, sort of use the phrase compression oriented programming, right? <clears throat> oh, I forgot. We haven't really talked about the fog stuff. So we'll, we'll talk about the fog stuff a little bit later. Um, we just took what we saw as how the API was being used and we make, um, we reduce the complexity of what's getting called by making utility functions that do the normal things. We don't remove the ability to do them at the lower levels because that's good. That gives us the granularity. If the user of this renderer wants to get more and more specific, they can, they don't have to use our camera and that's crucial. Don't force them to use something when we don't need to force them. Provide the option, right? Provide the option. Okay. Um, so now again, here's this same exact thing running, but again, the API is so much easier for someone who doesn't know what's going on. Look at how simple that is now. View from camera, push simple scene and render group, right? So, so, so simple. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Again, just making it easier and easier and easier and increasing that accessibility um, and reducing the likelihood of making those errors while still at the same time retaining all the power, right? Anyone can still now go in here and do all of the same meticulous calls, set their own camera transforms from their own material. All of that stuff could still work. So we have eliminated no capabilities and we've re we haven't reduced the power at all. All we've done is provide utilities that allow people to not care if they don't want to care, right? Okay. <clears throat> um, so now let's see about uh, bringing this uh, uh, even like even further, like I was saying. Um, so, so let's call get can standard camera here. Um, all that stuff looks fine. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just focus on the fact that we never implemented the fog. Okay. So let's extend our renderer, um, which we, like I said, we never did that renderer group, uh, stuff we needed to, to make the fog work. Uh, renderer.cpp is what I'm looking for actually. <clears throat> Here you can see, uh, the way we're passing this stuff in note. Uh, the way that we specify whether we want fog or not. So there's all this stuff, alpha clip distance. Uh, we have these settings. The person can't access them, right? They can't get, they can't get to it. Um, and we need them to be able to, to get there. Uh, right. Um, so there's a couple things. This uh, ortho call here, uh, when we pass in the flags, right? We're not passing in any flags here. So I, we don't have to worry about orthographic, I don't think. The fog value here, why that wasn't a flag, I have no idea. It so obviously should be a flag. Um, but what you can see is regardless of whether it's a flag or not, we need um, direction, start and end those need to be set, right? And the same thing is true of the clipping, the alpha clip. We need to set these things. Um, and if we don't set them, uh, then, then this stuff won't work, right? So let's go ahead and try to make this a little bit better than it is right now, because right now it's super crappy. Um, 
<clears throat> um, let's do an alpha clip and a fog. Let's remove the parameter for fog. Uh, something like this. Uh, and then we can pass those values in here, all these ones that we actually want. Now, the fact that you could just set them in the setup, it's kind of hard to say whether we should just do that. Um, I don't really know what I think about that. Uh, but basically, like, if we imagine passing all these things in here, you know, I don't have a strong opinion about it one way or the other, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So you can see it's a pretty huge set of features uh, we would have to pass here, right? Um, and it doesn't look great, right? It doesn't look great. So the question would become, you know, can we do something more sane here, right? Can we do something that would work better uh, than, what, than what we're doing here? Uh, and... I'm, I'm not sure. Here's, here's my proposal, right? It's not a good one. Uh, something like this. And do something like this. It's pretty easy to do that. Um, and I don't love it, but you can see that it's pretty straightforward, right? Um, you would just put these in here. Uh, and the alpha clip uh, ones in here. And so that's pretty basic. Uh, and then you'd pass them if you wanted them and you wouldn't if you wouldn't, right? So if you then look at, you know, the, uh, what I would actually define for these sort of default values, right? Uh, the default fog params, in this case, we just got direction, start distance and end distance. Uh, the default fog params is just all zeros, actually, if you look at it, right? So that one doesn't require anything. That's just good to go. Uh, and then the default alpha clip, um, is always phrased as being off of the near clip plane, it looks like. So I'm guessing what we can do is actually define these as like this, right? And the default values are these, uh, negative 100 and negative 99. And then the other values are these, right? These are the default ones for a clip start and end. Um,
I'm not really sure why they're this way in... I'm not sure why we don't just start at the near clip plane, but I'm sure we had a reason. Famous last words. Um, so yeah, so then if you want to uh, set up fog specifically, you set it up this way. If you don't, uh, you set it up the other way. Okay, so then in here, when you pass these uh, in for your fog params uh, and your alpha clip params, when you come in here, you actually always do assign them, right? Um, uh, and you pass in these. So that way, Uh, when these get passed in, you know, you set them how, up, up however you want to set them uh, and you pass them in as pointers. Like I said, uh, don't love it, but can't think of anything better. Seems about right. Uh, and... Yeah, I mean, we could have like a set call that we use uh, in some other way, I don't know, but that seems pretty good to me. And, oops, this is supposed to be off the clip. And so I think that's okay, you know? Um, so I'm just gonna try that. I'm gonna see how that goes. Uh, so yeah, if we go ahead and, and look a little bit further down the road there, uh, sorry, I'm just going to take a look at what we would need to do to make that stuff work. Um, don't know why I did that. That's the exact opposite. All right. So there we go. Okay, so set camera transform. Uh, we're now uh, down to just like looking at where these actually get called and uh, what the problems are when we actually call them. Uh, and so that's good. So now let's go through here. Uh, we don't need to call pass that anymore and we should work okay now if we just pass those defaults, right? So let's go ahead and run and verify that we actually do. So that's good, right? Now let's try to put in some alpha clipping or some fog just to make it clear that it works at all, because we don't know if it does, right? So I'm gonna go in here um, to where these were set up. I'm gonna first loft these. I'd like these to be um, available, uh, you know, up here, and, uh, so that when we're actually talking about render groups, uh, it's clear, so there's a, a, a render setup. Here it is. Uh, these are kind of like part of this. And we could actually include those in here if we wanted to in the future, right? I don't know that we necessarily want to, but we could. Um, so if I go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> and recompile here, oops, uh, instead of having this fog equals false nonsense, now I can just do a fog params uh, in, in uh, okay. Uh, I can do a fog params and the fog params, I can set the direction. Um, again, I, I want like a based on the camera Z. Uh, so I'm gonna again follow uh, sort of what's based, you know, what we're looking at here. So I'm gonna want the camera Z. And remember, I could actually pull this out ahead of time because it's this. There we go. Um, and so here I can just say the negative camera Z direction is the direction I want the fog to go. Um, the start distance is gonna be whatever and the end distance is gonna be whatever. So what are the distances we actually realistically want for the fog? Um, well, uh, I don't know, let's set four 
and 20 because that's just some distances. I don't know. Um, let's not forget we actually have to build our camera matrix first before we can get stuff out of it. Um, and so now we should be able to start to play with those values to see some fog eventually, assuming fog still works. I don't remember if there's other stuff that we have to do to make sure that the fog works. So I'm not seeing any yet. It should be based on distance from the camera. Uh, I need to make sure that we actually, well, I think that should have done it. Um, but I'm not sure. So I'll have to see if we're really getting, oh, <laughs> we didn't pass it. Got to start by passing it first. <clears throat> All right, so passing the fog down. Uh, so there we go. And that's great because now our fog is actually quite obviously there. Uh, let's stiffen it up a bit. So uh, here's a more dramatic fog. Uh, we'll start it at 8, end it at 10. So it's like a very dense fog at the end. Uh, that we, oh, my God. That's a very interesting, that outline. We have to look and see what's going on there. Our fog stuff is a little bit uh, chewy there, it looks like. What? Uh... What distance should we start at then? That's interesting. So I think our fog doesn't properly handle the... Uh, doesn't properly handle either the... Uh, alpha values or the uh, multi-sampling, and I'm not sure which. So that's something that'll be good to fix. Um, I'm not sure what yeah value we should use here. Okay, there we go. So you can see we've got some kind of bugs with the outlining there. Again, I'm not sure if that's depth peeler related or exactly who's uh, responsible for that. Um, But, but that's what we wanted, right? Uh, and similarly, uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird, weirdly shaped fog too. I feel like, yeah, so I feel like we've got some work to do. I feel like our fog's a little bit wonky. Um, but again, it is on camera Z, so I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, it's basically just the specification is what we care about now. We have to work on our shaders, obviously. We know that, so that's not a huge deal. Uh, but if we want to go ahead and set the direction to be different, um, maybe we set it to the world Y uh, or the world Z rather. So it's actually uh, an up, upward fog. So maybe the fog starts kind of um, at a low distance uh, as measured along Z. So, you know, the start uh, of it would be somewhere uh, um, um, around like the one, let's say, uh, and it would end somewhere around negative one. Uh, fog direction is measured relative to the camera though. So that makes it a little bit harder to do this. We don't have a way to do world space fog at the moment, which we probably should add. Uh, but if that's the case, then it has to be much lower. So the fog start distance would have to be <clears throat> if measured upwards. So we want to actually measure downwards from the camera. And it would be what, like that? Not sure. Um, so there's one that gets stiffer as you go down, right? Um, and again, it looks like everything's working properly, except we just, we have those edging artifacts on our fog there. So we'll have to figure out what we're doing wrong and fix those. Uh, but that's, you know, kind of for a different, different day. And you can see the fog has completely obscured the ground here, which is exactly what I wanted to see happen. Right. Um, so that's good. I'm pretty happy with all of that. So what I want to do now is make sure that that stuff can be set uh, in the actual um, 
camera values, you know, itself. Uh, so what I want to do here is say, you know, fog direction. Um, fog start, fog end. And one of the things that would be nice there is if the fog was actually based on a point, not on the camera. Um, and you could just pass the point. So I feel like we kind of wanted to do here. We want to basically say, here's the point to measure the fog from, and then here's the direction. Because we can always pass the camera. Um, but, you know, what if we don't want to pass the camera? What if we want some other point to be the fog basis, right? It's just something to think about. Okay, so what we want to do is say, okay, we're going to make some fog params here. Uh, maybe I'll just do it this way. Uh, leave that to do in there. And then, so once we get to here, I can just say, hey, uh, pass, pass the fog there. So now if I want to set these as default values, um, I can just say, uh, maybe there's a little bit of fog by default. I don't know exactly what that fog value uh, should be, but again, we'll just use sort of the stuff that we were playing around before and just call that good. Um, so fog direction in this case, I guess one problem is since it's based on the camera, uh, the fog direction in this case, I guess we kind of have to hard code that into the camera one way or the other. You'd have to have a setting for it. Um, and so I guess that sort of suggests why this maybe is, it would just be You know, uh, because we, for most purposes here, we want that to be, uh, you know, based on some direction that has nothing to do, uh, that, that has to do with the camera's location, probably, right? And, and I don't know, maybe it, need, it really wants to be more world oriented. We'll see eventually um, as we play around that a little bit more. And so here, all we're going to do is only have uh, the fog start uh, and the fog end. Uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Uh, so assuming that that's right, fog start, fog end, and negative camera Z, which I think is correct, uh, then let's just set these to something that uh, makes some sense here. Um, that's a little bit too much. And that's a little bit too little. There we go. Um, so now we've got the fog in there by default, uh, and that you know is just a you know parameter that anyone can play with uh, as they wish. Uh, so that's fine. Um, and now let's just put the alpha clip in there as well. So if we have the start and end points of our clipping alpha, again, those are based on the near clip plane. Uh, so we'll just set those to the two values we have here. We probably won't see anything happen uh, at the moment. But 
but we can try to construct some ways that we would. <clears throat> Again, just putting these in here. Okay, so clip alpha start and clip alpha end, just go in here. And now we have everything initialized via that camera params uh, itself. And alpha clip is now uh, engaged as well. So if we actually wanted alpha clip itself uh, to be something that <clears throat> excuse me, we saw happen in the render test, uh, we just need to move the camera closer. So in theory, if we just change the camera dolly, so like, here we change Dolly to like, you know, one instead of 10. So we're right up in it. Uh, we should start clip, well, that might just clip everything away. Um, we probably need to go back a little bit more than that. Uh, so let's try three. And then we can try to get that clip working. Um, so you can see the clip working. Unfortunately, it's a little bit hard because everything's brown here, but you can see the clip working just nicely there. Uh, so we're totally fine. Uh, let's move back a little bit. Uh, wow, so we have to move back quite a bit. How much, what does our camera dolly default to? Oh, it's 20, okay. I thought it was only 10. All right, so let's move close enough that we start clipping through some of these things. Uh, let's try eight meters displacement there. And you see, you get, you get really nice alpha clipping. I mean, you can almost not even see that that's what's happening. It's so smooth. So that's really nice obscuring those objects, right? So we can see through it. So that's really good. Um, so that's working just fine. Um, so I think all that's good now. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could also extend alpha clip out a bit further there. Okay. Um, so that's everything there. I think we're almost out of time. I'm going to go clean up the handmade hero side of things so that it's still calling, but that's good. I'm happy with where this is at now um, because now you just call that uh, and you're kind of off to the races. Here's the camera, uh, this camera code. <clears throat> Um, is really just now here to, you know, kind of do both rotation and offsetting. Um, and I mean, that is something the user has to do the way that they want to do it. Uh, so I think all this is really straightforward now. Um, I mean, it'd be hard to have a simpler API than this, right? The sum total is call this function, call this function, call this function if you want to, right? Then download your textures, start a frame, make as many groups as you want, say where they're viewed from, put the sprites in that you want, finish, and then render everything when you're done. Pretty straightforward. Um, And so about the only question I have is, can we get rid of the render groups? And we'll have to see, like, like are those necessary? Uh, Cause they might not be. <clears throat> um, Uh, 
I mean, it is very possible that we could just get rid of the render group. So we may be able to make one more simplifying uh, we may be able to make one more simplifying step. Um, we don't have any time left, do we? What time did we actually start? Anybody know? Help me out here, stream. Oh, all right, 1.30 p.m. Okay, okay. So I actually have 15 minutes, is that correct? All right. If I actually have 15 minutes, minutes may not be quite the amount of time that I would need to do something like this so I'm hesitant to do it but if we consider the render group and its reason for being I would say we really don't need it anymore um, basically this stuff can just be stuck onto uh, the render commands uh, And I mean, if we look, if you kind of look at what's happening there, it really, all we really need is just the clear command. Like this, Um, <clears throat> if we just undid a little of the change we did and had a begin depth peel, end depth peel, that's really all you would need. And you really don't need even that. You can assume that everything is through the depth peels and you could just have one call that's like, stop depth peeling now. Right? <clears throat> so I do think it's probably worth noting that you don't really need this thing. Whether that means we should get rid of it or not, hard to say, but we probably could. Right. I'm going to pop back to Handmade Hero, just clean that up. This is the focal length here. Sure, where else we've got stuff? Yeah. 
Um, so that's really the entirety uh, of the porting. So here is us running on the renderer here. Uh, here is us running on uh, the renderer inside the game. And if we now want to return, now what is true though is we now no longer have like any of our fog effects or any of those things happening uh, in the game proper. Uh, so to return those to uh, operational, I'm just going to put to do in here when we're ready, add alpha clip and fog back in here. Uh, right now we're not. I mean, I guess, you know what? We got the time now. Just do it, right? Just do it. Why not? Here's what they were set to before, right? Problem solved. So literally just setting the values exactly what they used to be set to. Um, in both the fog case and the alpha clip case. And now we can just adjust those as necessary out here to whatever we want. And when we actually set the game camera up, I can just pass them. Eventually we should actually have, um, we wanna set these values to things that we actually care about more. Um, so there's that, but yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you know, six and one half dozen or the other. So, uh, oops, I deleted the wrong values. Not very bright. Not very bright today, am I? It's eight and 20. Uh, so that's all we really need to do there. And we're, you know, good to go at that point. So... That should be the same as what we're using, but before, I, I think we had decided those really weren't the good values anymore because we kind of changed the perspective a little, uh, but at least they're still working correctly now, right? Um, so that's all good. I think that's all I want to do. Um, I don't think there's anything else really um, that we should do today. I'm pretty happy with how these are. Um, and so the only thing that I have left to get to, not sure if we want to remove render groups or not. Uh, that's kind of hard to say. Maybe they should stick in here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but this all looks real nice right now. Um, and I can maybe comment this a little bit. Um, so we'll ask Blombo, AKA windows to tell us what the size of our window is. Uh, we then, uh, use, uh, to figure out how to fit a 16 by nine, uh, drawing region in there. Remember, uh, or this is not necessary if you don't want a fixed aspect ratio, you can just use the whole thing. So uh, you can just pass the entire thing if you want to. Um, I'm not sure. So I can't really remember if we correct for that properly or not. Let's just see. I guess we've never really tested uh, I don't remember. So right now when we run, uh, oops, uh, we'll go to the render test there. <clears throat> uh, 
So right now when we run, right, we always maintain a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So you can see we get the black bars in there, uh, right? But if you didn't want that, um, so suppose you just always wanted the draw region to be uh, the entire thing, you could just pass this and that will fill the entire thing. Uh, I don't think that works if you don't pass, like you'll just stretch at that point, I think. Nope, that just works, I guess. So we actually reallocate the buffers and everything, I guess. Um, I couldn't remember if we actually did that, but I guess we do. So that actually reallocates all the buffers and everything for compositing and everything every time. So you can really just do that if you want to. Happy birthday. <clears throat> right? Um, so that's fine. So here I'm just commenting the code. We already know all this is, so I'm sorry to bore you with this, but I figured we might as well put it in here because this is the example app, right? Normally I don't put many comments in my code because I feel like they tend to get out of date, but this is the sample app. So it's kind of what we would expect to have as documentation so people can read it. Um, this is just a thing that is, you know, I want to tell people that we're calling process texture queue here. We don't really need to, this app doesn't stream textures, but if it did, Right. Um, Make sense? So I feel like we've got that API down pretty darn good, right? I think anyone could use this. Most of these calls aren't even for the API, they're just Windows nonsense or calls that initialize our test scene, right? Um, so really we're talking uh, one call here, 
one call here, one call here, one call here, 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 right? And each of them does something very specific. Seems good to me. All right, let's go to Q&A. <laughs> Jonathan Blow asks, how can I program a really good Windows update system like Windows has that makes sure you update all the time, especially if you are not home or are watching a movie right now? Um, that is a very good question, John. Um, so here's the thing. <clears throat> a lot of programmers who are inexperienced and aren't as good as the programmers who work at Windows might think that one of the things a computer should do is like take direction from the person using it. So for example, if that person says, don't update unless I tell you to, then that is what the computer should do. <clears throat> um, that's old school programming. That is not cutting edge. And as Microsoft knows, cutting edge involves artificial intelligence and deep learning. And one of the things that your code needs to deep learn is to completely ignore what the user is doing or wants, right? So the AI has learned that the best thing to do is just to do whatever it wants, regardless of what the user wants. And rebooting your machine and installing updates whenever it wants is, you know, is what it learned. It's deeper, it has learned deeper and more than you have as a human. So I don't think you should argue with that. Um, you know, basically what you're saying is that your puny little human brain that doesn't really know anything and doesn't have all kinds of flops and things uh, knows better when to install updates than Windows does. And that's just hubris, right? That's human hubris that you are bringing to the table. You're thinking crazy thoughts like, I paid two or $3,000 for this machine, and I had to pay $200 for this copy of an operating system that's crappier than the one that I had 20 years ago. And you're thinking that that gives you some kind of right to determine when your machine should do stuff, right? Or you're thinking absolutely ridiculous things like, if you pay $2,000 for a computer, it should be able to do computations for you at the time that you want it to, rather than when it wants to. All of those things are false. And Microsoft has figured out the true answers to those questions, which is that when you pay $200 for an operating system, it should literally not care at all what you want to do, who you are, or if you, you know, had something important that you need to do that time. That's not important. That's not deep. It's not learning. That's not artificially intelligent. I, I, I can't say anything other than that's like 1990s thinking. It's just obviously wrong. Off topic, you mentioned in the pre-stream fetching the cache misses. Do you mind explaining how it's done? Fetching the cache misses. Can you be more specific? What, what do you, which part of fetching cache misses? Do you mean texture cache misses? Uh, Sinochron, why do you want to remove the render group? What is the alternative? My following is a bit spotty, so I'm sorry if this is obvious from watching previous streams. 
Um, I just want to make sure that we don't have an extraneous step. So if really the person doesn't really need an extra struct in there, and they could have just used the render command structure and used just a bracket and call, <clears throat> that's probably better. And I think that's where we're at. I don't think you can really use render groups for anything at the time. At render commands is really where everything's going. So it's sort of like a vestigial remain. And so I feel like it should probably just be removed. What is your opinion of the Vulkan API? Is it overkill to use it for a little indie game or is it worth the thousands of setup code lines? Um, so my opinion on Vulkan is, first of all, I don't think it's a very good API. I don't think it was designed well. Um, I, I honestly don't think almost any thought was put into the design of the API from an actual, like, is this a good API standpoint? And I say that because I actually tried to help on the design of the API and got literally nowhere trying to convince people to think about the sort of things that I literally was just talking about um, on here. I think it was primarily designed just to be the quickest thing they could get out the door um, that was a version of Mantle that was cross vendor. That's what I think. I think it shows. I think it's a really bad API. I don't like any part of the design. Um, so I'll just full stop, it's a lousy API. That said, so are most APIs, right? So, you know, OpenGL has tons of problems with it. Direct3D has tons of problems with it. Metal has tons of problems with it, whatever. You know, do people spend a lot of time figuring out whether these APIs are well-designed? No. So that's not a reason not to use it. It's just an observation that I don't think there's any value to the Vulkan API as an API. I don't think it's good, right? So you wouldn't use it because it's a good API, but you might still want to use it because it's the most effective thing to talk to the hardware. So that's, I think, the question you need to ask. Is it the most effective thing for you to talk to the hardware? In the current landscape, my answer is no. I don't think it is. On Windows, you should use Direct3D. <clears throat> it's the native API. Um, and the reason why you might use OpenGL like we do is for cross-platform. It used to be that it ran on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So for an educational stream like this, even though it's less well-supported on Windows, it's still a useful thing to use for educational purposes, right? It's easier for people to follow along on Mac, etc. That landscape has unfortunately changed. Mac has decided they will no longer support OpenGL. So the handmade hero of five years from now, if it was getting started at that time, wouldn't have that option. There is no cross-platform API anymore, right? There's only metal on Mac and everything else that you might call is actually on top of metal. So you've pretty much got to use it. Otherwise you're just adding a ton of cruft, right? You might as well just use a, a good API that sits on top of metal. You wouldn't use Vulkan because it's a bad API that sits on top of metal, right? Um, so it really is looking like a world where in the future, what you will do is you will program D3D on Windows and metal on Mac. So I don't see any reason for Vul uh, Vulkan is not useful. Um, from what I can see, uh, it doesn't really have a reason to exist anymore. Maybe it will become the crappy API you use to replace OpenGL ES on Android, right? And that's something it could do. Um, or maybe it will become the Linux default API, I don't know. Uh, but but yeah, it, it doesn't serve much of a purpose at this point. Uh, I mean, memory cast misses. Um, okay, so Memory cache misses. That's a very broad topic. Uh, I, I hate to keep asking to be more specific, but what kind of memory cache misses are you interested in hearing about? Uh, like what prompted you to ask about memory cache misses? Is there, was there something specific or you just mean in general, what is a memory cache miss? You he, what steps are you going to do to optimize the render? So primarily uh, the main thing we, we need to do um, is we need to uh, coalesce our textures into texture arrays so they can be switched quickly. Um, that's our number one thing. 
The number two thing is uh, to fin finalize our lighting and make a simpler lighting, uh, <clears throat> make it so we do less lighting ops in the shader as well. So those are the two things that need to happen uh, before the renderer would be like a shipping thing that, that you'd be like, okay, you know, this is okay. Uh, Accidental Rebel, I'm making DOS games for fun. Do you have experience making games during the DOS era? A little bit, um, but I was still, during the DOS era, I was still in high school. Um, I, I didn't actually make it into the industry until after DOS games had kind of ended. Um, and, uh, so as far as, uh, as far as ever working professionally on one, no, but I have done DOS, uh, you know, Modex programming in DOS, uh, as a hobby when I was little. Oops. Ah, okay, 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 now we've got it. Sorry, I'll rephrase it. Is there a function that tells you how many L1, L2, et cetera, cache misses happened since, for example, the last time you called the function? Yes. Um, the problem, if I recall, and I don't think this ever got fixed. So somebody jump in and correct me if I'm wrong here because it may be that they fixed it eventually. The problem is that you can't do it without a device driver. So there are, they're built into the CPU. They're called performance counters. They can tell you those things. Uh, you can't access them without ring zero assistance, I believe. Um, so for example, in Handmade Hero, we have a built-in profiler, right? Like if we, let's say we build in, um, in optimized mode, uh, and I run the game. Uh, oops, here's the game. Uh, if I run the game, you can see in this profile, we got all this information saying like how many cycles we spent in different things, right? We're getting that from the call RDTSC, read timestamp counter, which is a CPU performance register uh, that you use to figure out how many roughly instructions it has issued, right? Um, not instructions, how many cycles it has issued. It's, it's a whole ball of wax to say what that number actually means, but it's related to how many instructions got issued in a certain sense. Um, although you can issue multiple instructions on a cycle and they're not really measuring cycles because of speed step and blah, 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 blah. So RDTSC, hard to explain exactly what it's measuring and it depends on the chip, but it's effectively a performance counter that tells you about how many cycles elapsed since the last time you called it. There exists similar performance counter set up things you can do where you can ask the chip to count things like L2 cache misses, much like you can ask it how to um, count cycles retired. To the best of my knowledge, you can't call them uh, without a device driver. So what people often do is you can install something uh, you don't have to write the dev device driver yourself. You can install someone else's device driver that will access this information for you. So for example, Intel ships a program called VTune that does this, you probably have heard of. It's got uh, device drivers that will get that information for you. There's probably others. Um, I just don't know what they all are. When you actually care about this most is usually on things like PlayStation and stuff like that, and they're, they, you just get access to them. Uh, they are provided as part of the default system software there uh, for obvious reasons, right? Because everyone wants to use it. On the PC, I don't know. Uh, you know, Windows 10 or the Windows performance counters might allow you to get those. I've never tried to get them that way. You might be able to get it out through that. Um, but yeah. So the answer to your question, though, broadly speaking, is yes, you absolutely can get that data. No, unfortunately, it's not as simple as just issuing an RDTSC like we do, but you can do it. You just have to go a like slightly more um, a roundabout way. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, after ending up with the renderer part, which do you think is the next Mac or something, Hammy Hero? Um, going through and like decorating the world, right? Like uh, putting in like grass and uh, changing like walls depending on what rooms you're in and stuff like that. Uh, do you ever see Linux as a consumer machine? Um, not really. Uh, I, I could see something like the Steam, like let's say Steam, uh, Valve got serious about Steambox and shipped like a dedicated Steambox, like this is the Steambox, not multi-vendor, like we actually just packaged it. I could see that working. A dedicated known hardware configuration with a specifically optimized version of Linux that targets only that hardware and is optimized to run it and runs it reliably with a custom UI on top like big picture or something could work. Uh, and Martins mentions that on Linux that you can get those uh, L1, L2 cache things with the perf utility. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that. I'll take your word for it. It's the kind of thing I would have expected to be able to get on Linux. So that's cool that they avoid it. I mean, that they provide it. Um, I just don't know of anything similar on Windows. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I don't know of any way to get it on Windows without installing the device drivers of some kind, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, there's multiple ways of getting that device driver, but as far as I know, you have to do that. It's cool that Linux doesn't force you to do that, right? All right, let's wrap it up. Close these things down here. There we go. All right, thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you want to follow the series at home, you can always peer to the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with the source code uh, so you can follow along uh, and uh, try experiments yourself. Uh, maybe you want to try optimizing the renderer to use texture arrays before I do. Uh, you've got the option to do it, right? A um, couple other things to note. We have a watch page on the Handmade Hero page that allows you to watch the series. It's got a uh, window that'll show the stream when it's live and show the schedule when it's not, so you know when it will be live. Uh, it's also got the episode guide on there so you can catch up on past series. It's pretty cool. You can just type in anything you want to search for. It'll search for all the episodes and you can jump right to the part of the episode where I talk about it. It's a pretty awesome feature. And of course, we have the Handmade Fund if you want to contribute to that, which is what supports work uh, that people do like that, uh, like that watch uh, pages episode guide, uh, which wouldn't be possible without it. Um, also, obviously, if you just want to check out what we're doing at, at uh, Molly Rocket, uh, you can always uh, join our mailing list here and you got the little handmade hero head you can click on, uh, which brings you to all of our other pages, my blog as well, and, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so check that out when you get a chance. That's about it. Um, I will be back. Pro I Well, I don't know if I'll be back next week. I may have to take next weekend off. Uh, in fact, it's highly likely, I think, that I will have to uh, for other reasons. So check the schedule page. Uh, we'll see when I'll be back, maybe the week after that or in three weeks time, we'll see. Uh, so there might be a brief little uh, mini back to school vacation, um, but uh, until then, whenever it is, it'll be a couple weeks from now at, at most. Uh, hopefully everyone <clears throat> can find some interesting programming to do in the meantime. Uh, and until then, I will see everyone on the internet. So take it easy, everybody.